so we talked about rate of reaction last time and we talked about how there are five factors that affect the speed of reaction and we can measure the rate based on uh, different experimental setups like we could use a uh, collection of gas or change in mass or so many different ways of figuring out how the rate is going on all of that we talked about in the context of experiments or reactions that went to completion so that's a term that we use that reaction goes to completion what that means is that all the limiting reactant it used up again another term here limiting reactant and going to completion what does that mean so i'll give an example let's suppose i burn hydrogen with oxygen and that makes some water now hydrogen is the fuel here so if i'm burning it and i'm getting oxygen from the air as long as i have some fuel the reaction should continue if i let it so once i run out of the fuel this reaction will stop even though i have oxygen in the air there is no more fuel available so reaction will stop so it is the fuel that has limited how much reactant how much product is made or how much reaction should go on so that is what a limiting reactant is it is the thing the main thing that limits how much process or how much output is done so this happens in all of our uh, in fact many life processes or many decisions that we take they all be, are based on limiting reactants so for example if i want to figure out a time uh, for let's suppose i want to keep another class for you guys now i will have to identify a suitable time slot and the limiting reactant over there is that that slot should be in a time zone that we are all in so if there are students from let's suppose uk i need to make sure that the time that we assign to the class is suitable for them so that's a limiting option there if i keep a class at a time which is really early for them or which is during the school time for them even though it suits people in pakistan that time will be problematic for them to attend a class there's no other thing that they have uh, that's an obstacle it's just that time zone thing just like that in any reaction you have to figure out what is that one thing that causes the reaction to stop once it runs out and that is limiting reactant and we are assuming that you are going to use all the limiting reactant no more limiting reactant is available so the reaction goes to completion that reaction has been done as much as it could be as long as limiting reactant was available but reversible reactions are a different category reversible reactions stop way before they go to completion so even if you still have hydrogen available or oxygen available or water available but if this was a reversible reaction and we show it like that through this double arrow this would mean that the reaction will stop even if you had limiting reactant available so in these reactions it is not the limiting reactant that causes the reaction to stop or anything in fact the reaction doesn't stop at all but the product is also not made any more so that's a really weird concept to understand so here's the thing normally if i were to burn hydrogen we will be getting steam and unless we had we run out of hydrogen we will keep getting steam but in reversible reactions if this was a reversible reaction even if you had hydrogen even if you had oxygen and even if you're getting steam you will not get any more steam despite the hydrogen and oxygen being there in reversible reactions it is not the reactants that cause it to stop or cause it to produce less amount in fact it is another thing which we call equilibrium equilibrium 
is basically a state where the rate of reaction is equal in both sides or for both sides. Again, what does that mean? When the reactant becomes product, we say that it is going to the right or it's the forward side. And when the product is making reactant, we call it the backward side. So equilibrium or dynamic equilibrium, dynamic, yeah. dynamic equilibrium is basically when the rate of reaction the speed at which reactants become products is the same at which products become reactants. So the forward reaction, the speed is the same as the reaction or rate or speed in the backward direction. So what is dynamic equilibrium? It is when the rate of forward reaction is the same as rate of backward reaction. Okay, so that's dynamic equilibrium. Why does it happen? For many, many different reasons. And we don't need to go into those reasons in O-levels or IGCSE. We just need to know that there is a thing called dynamic equilibrium. And that is when the reaction goes in the forward direction and also comes back in the backward direction. And when both are happening at the same speed, we say an equilibrium has been reached. So two terms so far, we have talked about reversible reactions, which are basically when a reactant makes product and the product goes back to make reactants. We've talked about limiting reactant, which is normally an important factor in reactions, but not so much in reversible reactions. And we've talked about dynamic equilibrium, which is when rate of forward reaction is same as rate of backward reaction. So let me take a very famous example for this. Nitrogen reacts with hydrogen and it makes ammonia in a reversible process. This is called Haber process. It's a technique that Fritz Haber mastered in the early 1920s. And it's a really, really uh, important process because through this process, we were able to uh, override or undo a couple of famines in the world. So this process, because he was able to master it, it saved millions of lives, literally. So Haber process is a reversible process. And the reaction is that nitrogen reacts with hydrogen, makes ammonia. But because it's a reversible process, as more and more ammonia is made, those ammonia molecules collide with each other and we break down to make nitrogen and hydrogen again. So in the forward side, you have nitrogen colliding with hydrogen, making ammonia. And in the backward side, you have ammonia colliding with other ammonia, making nitrogen and hydrogen again. Now, if you're somebody who has set up this factory where you're trying to produce ammonia, you do not want the reaction to go backwards. You want the reaction to go forward. Or at least you want it to go forward more than it goes backward, right? And for that, we have the idea of what we call LCP, Le Chelier's principle. Okay. This one, so Le Chelier principle basically says that the equilibrium shifts to undo any stress on it. So a couple of words here that we need to understand. First of all, what is equilibrium? It is when the rate of forward reaction is the same as rate of backward reaction. So it is when no more product is made overall, the concentration is constant. So the graph will look something like this. So initially I have nitrogen. So nitrogen ki koi amount T Nitrogen is being used up, used up, used up, and suddenly it becomes a constant. It does not change anymore. So this is nitrogen. Similarly, 
For hydrogen, there might be some amount. So let's suppose this was the amount. So it goes down, 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 and then it reaches a constant value. It doesn't change anymore. Similarly, initially I did not have any ammonia. So it was at zero and then it, some of it was made, 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 and ultimately it became a zero, a constant again. Now you can notice that over here, we might assume that the reaction is complete, but it's actually not. The reaction is still happening. Nitrogen is still reacting with hydrogen to make ammonia and ammonia is still breaking down to make nitrogen and hydrogen again. But the more ammonia is made, the more it breaks down. So there is no change in how much ammonia is and how much nitrogen is and how much hydrogen is in the reaction vessel. So what happens here is that even though nitrogen reacts with hydrogen and makes ammonia, the more ammonia it makes, the more ammonia comes back and makes nitrogen and hydrogen. So overall amounts do not change. Reaction still goes on. Energy is still used. They're still paying the labor and the engineers and the chemists, everybody who is keeping it running. They're still going to pay the electricity bills or gas bills or whatever utilities you're using. But the amount of ammonia that you've made, it's constant. You are unable to make any more ammonia. And that is a situation in which no factory owner or any chemist wants to be because it's economical loss. If you're still, you know, you set up a factory for making ammonia and you're not getting any more of it, then obviously you're bearing loss of so many other things. So you don't want to go into that situation. So what do we do? We apply the Le Chatelier's principle for that. And what is Le Chatelier's principle? It's simple. It says you, if you have reached an equilibrium, so that's the first thing you need to have an equilibrium. If the equilibrium is not there, I cannot really apply Le Chatelier's principle there. So first of all, your situation might be that you have reached an equilibrium. Your rate of forward reaction is the same as rate of backward reaction. Okay. Next, you change any factor there. You apply a stress on the equilibrium. What does that mean? Applying a stress means changing the situation. So it could be you change the temperature. You change the pressure, you change the number of nitrogen molecules there. you add more nitrogen, or maybe you remove ammonia through fractional distillation or something. You basically change something in the reaction. So that is stress. You have introduced a stretch on the reaction. So what will equilibrium do now? If you introduce any stress, the equilibrium will try to undo that stress. So whatever you do, reaction will do exact opposite of it. And that's really interesting. Again, why does it happen? We don't really need to go into that detail in O levels or IPCs. In A levels, we do that to some extent, but not so much. So does everybody understand what dynamic equilibrium is, what reversal processes are, and what Le Chatelier principle says? So now we know that whatever you do to the reaction, it will try to undo it. The equilibrium will shift so that it undoes it. Okay, so let's see what stress can we apply. So in the previous chapter, rate of reaction, we talked about that, all right, there are five different things that affect the rate. There's the temperature, there's the pressure, there's concentration, there's catalyst, and there's the surface area. Okay, so these are the five factors. But here's the thing. If you change pressure, it applies to gases only. So it does affect the rate of reaction and it is a stress that you can introduce. If you change the temperature, it does change the kinetic energy, which means how fast or slow they collide. So it is a good stress. If you change the concentration, that means how many particles you have. So obviously how many collisions there occur. And yes, it is a valid stress, but catalyst simply reduces the activation energy. Catalyst is not a stress. The only thing catalyst does is it increases the rate of reaction. So in reversible reaction, you have a forward reaction and you have a backward reaction. So what catalyst does is it reduces the activation energy for both of them. Forward ki bhi kam kar deta hai, backward ki bhi kam kar deta hai. They both are going to be faster now. So it hasn't really helped you as far as reversible reaction or equilibrium is concerned. 
Similarly, surface area is something that applies to solids only. So you can't really, uh, the reaction doesn't take this as a stress either. So we have five factors that affect the rate of reaction, but only three of them qualify as stress. Temperature, pressure, concentration. So let's start with a really simple one, the concentration. So here's the thing. I do one thing and equilibrium does something in response. So here's the thing. We are playing a game here. What can I change? I have nitrogen, hydrogen, ammonia. Let's suppose I add nitrogen. So I've changed the concentration of nitrogen. This side, I have increased it. So what does the reaction want me to do? Reaction wants to decrease it, right? Equilibrium shifts to undo any stress on it. I have added more nitrogen. There are so many nitrogen particles here. The reaction is going to push it in the forward direction. Reaction is going to use it. The nitrogen is that I've added. It's going to be used and more ammonia is made. Why? Because if I have more collisions of nitrogen particles, more ammonia is made, which means nitrogen is used up. So it is reduced. When I usko add kiya tha, reaction usko use kar liya. If I do the same thing with hydrogen, same thing happens. I you add more hydrogen. There are more collisions of hydrogen particles. And so more ammonia is made and hydrogen is used up. There you go. Let's suppose I do fractional distillation and I remove ammonia. So I have decreased it. So the reaction will try to increase it, which means it reduces these to make this. And I say that if I remove ammonia, reaction will try to make more of it. And that means forward reaction will occur faster than the backward reaction. So I say equilibrium shifts forward shifts forward. What does that mean? That means the forward reaction happens quicker and the backward reaction happens slower. Now, if I do the exact opposite, if I remove nitrogen or hydrogen reactants, as far as the reactions concerned, it's the reactant versus the product. So if I remove any nitrogen from it, the reaction tries to make more nitrogen. So that means it comes back. So that means more nitrogen or hydrogen is made up, ammonia is used. So this we say that equilibrium shifts backward, that it's going to the reactant site. Okay, really simple. So concentration, we have just applied Lichelter's principle. If you increase one side, the reaction goes to increase the other side. So in that way, it uses that. So if you add more product, it's going to make more reactant. And that means its product will be less. If you add more reactant, product will be more. So we say that equilibrium shifts forward. Another thing that it affects is how much of the product you are getting, which is called yield. So if I add more nitrogen, more ammonia is made. So yield is higher. But if I remove nitrogen, less ammonia is made, so yield is lower. In other words, if the equilibrium shifts backward, yield is less, which means less product is made. And if the equilibrium shifts forward, yield is high, more product is made. Let me try to do this. Now we are going to change pressure. So, you know, pressure only affects gases. Okay, so gases only. So, let's see in this reaction do we have gases? Of course, we do. This is a gas, this is a gas, this is a gas. In fact, all three things in here are gases. But here's what we have to consider it is not what gas that matters, it is how many gas moles are there. 
So if you look at this reaction, nitrogen plus three hydrogen makes ammonia. What the reaction really sees is I have four moles on the left side and I have two moles on the right side. That is what it sees, the ratio. So if I increase the pressure, so let's suppose I increase the pressure, then the equilibrium goes to side with less moles. Why? Because pressure is nothing but collision of particles. More moles means more collision. Less moles means less collision. So if I increase the pressure, that means particles are colliding more. And what particle is colliding the most? The reactant side, the four voila. So if I want to reduce the collisions, I will push it forward so that less pressure is made. So I increase the pressure. Le Chalter principle makes it go forward because that is where gases moles are left or less, sorry. Similarly, if I decrease the pressure, the reaction tries to increase it. And what side has higher pressure? The left side. So equilibrium goes backwards, which means side with more gaseous moles. So in pressure, we just have to look at which side has more particles. So the side with higher number of moles has higher collision. So if you increase the pressure, the reaction goes to lesser number of moles. And if you decrease the pressure, the reaction goes to the higher number of moles because it wants to undo what you just did. All right. The third factor, which is temperature. And that's also really, really easy. In temperature, reaction doesn't look at the product or reactant. In fact, what the reaction looks at is which side is exothermic and which side is endothermic. So this side is exothermic, this side is en endothermic in this case. So when you increase the temperature, the reaction goes to the cooling side. You have hot, you have increased the temperature, things are getting hotter. You want to, the reaction will try to reduce the temperature going to the endothermic side. So it goes to endothermic side. So obviously in this case, it's going to be backwards. Similarly, if you decrease the temperature, it's going to increase the temperature. I and mean, what better way to do that than an exothermic reaction? So it goes to the exothermic side because it wants to increase the temperature. So the reaction is only doing opposite of what you do to it. Okay. Now, if you increase the temperature, it also has a different effect on it. When you have higher temperature, the rate of reaction is also higher because particles have higher kinetic energy. So there's another idea here that if you increase the temperature, it speeds the reaction up. And if you decrease the temperature, it speeds the reaction down. Or we say that it speeds it up or slows it down based on what you do. So if you decrease the temperature, the reaction will slow down. Even though it's going to the exothermic side, it is going to be slowed down because it has less kinetic energy. Now, in some reactions, we don't do that. We want to have a faster reaction, even though this is something that reaction does not favor. Why? Because here's the thing. If it goes to the endothermic side in this case, that is the left side, right? So that means you're getting less ammonia. And when you have less ammonia, that means you have less yield. So if you're somebody who wants to make ammonia, you want the reaction to go forward. You don't want it to go backwards. So you want to have low temperature. But the problem with that is that reaction is going to be really, really slow. And you're going to waste a lot of time waiting for ammonia to be made. So what people do, they do and compromise. They do this reaction at a high temperature. Even though 
it reduces the amount of ammonia that is made, but it does so in very short amount of time. So they save time and lose extra ammonia that they could have made. And that is the idea of compromise here. That in many, many reactions, which are exothermic and lower temperature makes the reaction produce more product or makes gives us a better yield, we still don't prefer that. We still do these reactions at high temperature. And why is that? Because we want to save time. We want to have a higher speed of reaction compared to higher amount of product. So that's the idea of compromise. So three factors, all of them affected by LCP. So the bar is a dick. You have any reaction. You have reaction. You have to take three things. If you have a pass, I'll give you another example. So let's suppose this is a reaction. Uh, I have carbon burning in a reversible reaction, for example, to make carbon dioxide. This is solid. This is gas. This is gas. Now, if this is a reversible reaction, let's analyze it to see what, what will be the effect on rate and what will be the effect on yield. Yield is how much product is made. So here's the thing. Let's suppose I want to talk about concentration. And when you talk about concentration, then what you look at is not the equation, but you look at it like reactant to product. That's it. That's what you have to look at. So if I add more reactant, if I add more of this, then reaction goes forward, right? If I add more reactant, reaction goes forward. And that means rate is higher and yield is higher. Now let's suppose. I decrease the reactant. So I add less carbon. So the reaction goes backward. The rate is slowed down and the yield is also less because the action is going backwards. So when you're talking about concentration, the only thing you look at is reactant and product. You don't look at individual things. Okay. Let's suppose we're going to talk about product uh, pressure. So when I'm going to talk about pressure, then I'm not going to look at reactant product. I'm going to look at gaseous moles. So how many gaseous moles do I have on the left side? Just one. And how many on the right side? Just one, which means that no matter what I do, if I increase the pressure, then the rate is increased, but yield is unaffected. And why is that? Because I have the same number of moles on both sides for gases. I'm ignoring the solids. It's only the gases that matter. So the yield is unaffected. I'm going to get it faster. The rate is higher, but the yield stays unaffected. If I decrease the pressure rate is slowed down, but the yield still remains unaffected because the number of moles of gas is same on the both sides. Now let's look at temperature. When you talk about temperature, you don't look at the reaction product again. In fact, what you look at, is which side is exo and which side is endo. So in this case, in this case, it goes from positive to negative like this. Okay, so let's suppose I increase the temperature. So the reaction goes backward. So that means my rate is going to go up. Why? Because temperature, higher temperature means higher kinetic energy, more collisions. But yield goes down. Why? Because it's going backwards to the left. It's going where my reactant is more, not where product is more. Now, if I decrease the temperature, then this is how you look at the reaction. So if I decrease the temperature, it goes to the exothermic side. But at lower temperature, rate is low, but yield is still high because it's going to the forward side. So here's the thing. If you notice, whenever it goes to the right, yield goes up. Right. So yield goes up if forward is favored. Every time reaction in the forward direction is favored, reaction to the right is favored, equilibrium shifts right, equilibrium shifts forward, yield is more. Every time that happens, pressure affects gaseous moles, temperature affects endothermic and exothermic sites and concentration looks at reaction and product. The rule is always the same, no matter what equation. Let's do another one. 
So I have um, sulfur dioxide. I reacted with oxygen to produce sulfur trioxide. A very famous reaction. This is called contact process where it happens. Okay, so this is endothermic, exothermic on this side. Okay, so let's analyze this. <clears throat> so I have concentration, I have temperature, and I have pressure, three factors that I can change. And I want to now analyze what effect it has on the uh, rate and what effect it has on the yield. Remember, yield only goes up when reaction goes forward. Okay, when you look at concentration, you don't look at the equation, you look at the reactant and product. That's it, that is what you look at. So that means if I increase SO2, for example, then I've increased the reactant, so reaction goes right. Yield goes up, rate goes up. Similarly, if I decrease the reactant, then the reaction goes left. So the rate goes down and the yield also goes down because it's going to the left. So really, really simple. For temperature, you don't look at the equation again. You just look at which side is negative, which side is positive. So it goes from positive to negative in this way. So if I increase the temperature, then it favors the endothermic side reaction rate is high because temperature makes it collide more, but yield is low because it's going to the left. If I decrease the temperature, it favors the forward side, the exothermic side, rate is slowed down because temperature, low temperature means low kinetic energy, low collisions, but yield is favored. And when you talk about pressure, Again, you don't look at the product or reactant, you just look at the gaseous moles. So what do I have here? I have two hair and one hair, three moles on the left side of gas and two moles on the right side. So this is how it goes, three to two. So that means if I increase the pressure, reaction goes to the side with less moles. So it goes forward react, rate is higher, yield is higher. But if I decrease the pressure, it goes to the side with more moles, which is to the left. So the rate is slowed down and the yield is also slowed down. And that is what this chapter is. It's all about applying literality principle on any equation that you get, looking at what affect any stress can have on it and how you can favor the forward side. Okay. Now, how do they ask you questions on this? In MCQs, they're going to ask you questions about the concept. They're going to ask you about Le Shelter principle itself. They're going to ask you about definition of equilibrium. They're going to ask you about a certain effect that they've done. So for example, they'll give you an equation. They'll be like, we have increased the pressure. Tell me which side has higher yield what effect it has on the yield, what effect it has on the rate. So all those factors matter. They're going to ask you conceptual questions like, if I add catalyst, does it affect the yield? No, it doesn't, because the catalyst speeds up both the reactants. Similarly, they can ask you that if I add a catalyst, what happens to the activation energy of the backward process? So it's simple. It doesn't matter whether it's forward or backward process, activation energy is reduced because it's a catalyst. That's what they do. They can ask you to draw graphs of that, which you have done in the energetic chapter. So that's the MCQs. In theory, they can ask you to, number one, explain what happens when you increase the temperature on a reaction or the concentration on a reaction or the pressure on a reaction, or they can ask you about the compromise. That if a reaction is exothermic, why do people still do it at high temperature? And the, react, the reason is that at high temperature, it has a lower yield, sure, but it has a higher rate. So time is money. So they save time and they let the yield go down. 